not to call the meeting to order. Would everyone please stand and join us for the flag salute? Oh, we're to the left. Salute, pledge. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Th
So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Corneo, principal of the high school, and he has a few words uh, for Casey. And Casey, would you please join him? Good evening. You know, in 1985, when I was in 10th grade, <laughs> I walked into room F5, and there was this young man from, who graduated from Westmont, and it was Mr. Roberts. <laughs> and I've known him ever since. He's been my mentor. He's been uh, a role model, and I'm, he's a person that I always go to to make sure I'm doing the right thing. Uh, he's my conscience. Okay. Uh, he does not know that, that I will constantly be visiting him at home. <laughs> to make sure that fine, but he has many plans after uh, retiring. Uh, Mr. Roberts came to Carpenter High School in 1985. During this time, he has dedicated himself to becoming mas a master teacher. He has served as a department chair for social studies. He has been teaching AP U.S. history, and he has served as staff advisor for the junior states of America. <clears throat> Additionally, Mr. Roberts was a soccer coach for eight years, where he helped to develop the soccer program that is now very successful. Mr. Roberts graduated from Westmont College with a degree in history, and during his time at Westmont, he was an All-American soccer player and participated in the World University Games. A student of his from many years ago, Karina Jugula, once said, Mr. Roberts is without a question one of the best, if not the best, teachers I've ever had. In addition to this, he is one of the kindest, most, most understanding, and sincere people that I have known. Mr. Roberts always maintains high expectations of his students and constantly challenges them to become their best. Mr. Roberts is always there to greet his students in the morning with a warm smile and a calm demeanor. I've never seen him angry. Hmm. But when I knew that something had gone wrong is when it, he, he had only sent a student to the office once. So I knew that that happened, something happened that day. But he's always very calm. Students really admire him. Students really go to him for advice, and he's always there for students. He is one of the most kindest persons I've ever known. Uh, when you walk into Mr. Roberts' classroom, you are transformed into a classroom where students are the center of attention and instruction. He constantly seeks, way, seeks ways to bring the curriculum to life and to develop higher level, level thinking skills. He has worked with many students at Carpentry High School, and he has advised many of our students to where they are today, being young, productive citizens of our country. Mr. Roberts is married to his wife, Kathy, who's here tonight, and they have two boys, Tristan and Matt. Uh, Mr. Roberts will be greatly missed at Carpentry High School. Uh, on behalf of all of us at Carpentry High School, the students and the staff, I want to uh, wish you the best. I know you're going to travel a lot. Uh, and I always remember, we always look forward to substitutes coming back to Carpentry <laughs> High School. Uh, so I do have your number. But uh, again, thank you very much for what you've given to our community. I did the math the other day. And if uh, all the students in his class graduated, he has uh, worked with almost 5,000 students. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for what you've done to our community. Thank, thank you. you. to see the great times that you're having. Thank you. <laughs> and a certificate of appreciation. And a plant. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. you want to say any words? I'm just going to keep it real brief because uh, all I have to say is that's, that's the joy of a teacher right there, to see your former student go on to college, the first in his family to do so, to go on to graduate school, to become uh, a teacher, to become a mentor, a vice principal, a principal, and uh, to be a leader. Um, that, that is how proud I am of Gerardo. I cannot tell you. I know that you are too. He, he is a, uh, just a gift to this community. He knows the community. He gets it. And it is such a treasure to be able to say, I work for my former student um, and I will miss telling people that so um, and just just one other thing about Gerardo he when he calls my house he still asks for Mr. Roberts and he won't you won't use my first name I don't know if that's going to change but uh, I just I'm thankful I'm grateful um, I'm so appreciative of this community your children to have had so many your children 
Thomas Maine, your husband, and all the rest. What a, what a gift. I couldn't have imagined a career that went by so fast and it was so full and rich. So I'm dead of gratitude to all of you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Roberts, I would just would like to uh, thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, for guiding, like I already said, thousands of students, and among them, my daughters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, th I thank you, Casey. I mean, it. it uh, I think Gerardo really summarized it so well. But, but, um, I and I know you know this, but you should be so proud of of the positive influence you've had on so many of our students and and so many of our students have gone on to great things as in a large part due to to the influence you've had on their lives and um you will be truly missed here and and uh we hope you come back and 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 visit and substitute <laughs> but but enjoy your enjoy your retirement and and your travel and and i know you will and your bicycle and uh and um you know, best of luck. I, too, want to say thank you, Casey. Samantha talks about you often, and um, my mentee, Tanya, you guided her very well, too. So thank you. Okay, well, I'm here. To, I have two uh, retirees to announce tonight or to recognize tonight. My first one is uh, Mrs. Bunny Lesh, and she's here tonight with her two sons, Jason and Sean. And she's got her two grandchildren with her, too. The grandchildren can go up, too. It's all family. <laughs> <laughs> That's Channy and yeah. Bo. Bodhi. We like to see everyone. <laughs> so Mrs. Lesh has been serving students at Canalino Schools since 1988, so for 31 years. She has worked in as instructional assistant and our library multimedia tech for a number of years. Bunny is a fixture on our campus known to all students for all of these years as a gentle and kind soul. And Sally knows this. She was Bunny's principal as well. Mm -hmm. Bunny fills so many roles other than her official role in the library. Yearly, she helps plan and execute the Battle of the Books, put on book fairs, is our social chair on campus, ensuring all staff who have lost a family member receive card and flowers, plans baby and wedding showers, and re recognizes major life events for everyone. Mrs. Lesh also organizes Dr. Seuss Day every year and recruits many community volunteers to read to students on those days. Bunny helps us coordinate the annual talent show and helps bring out all the best in all of our students. Mrs. Lesh supports teachers, staff, and students across the campus in countless ways. This year, she has been a frequent sub for facilitating kindergarten, second, and third grade ELD groups when we have staff absent. <laughs> She knows each and every child and is able to step in and run a reading group. She's a crucial part of annual events like the Relay for Life Recess for Maria, the annual Jogathon, the Halloween Parade, and the fifth grade promotion. She's just always there right when we need her. From a former colleague and fellow Canalino retiree, Cindy Calvin, Bunny's kindness, character, and love have always been felt well beyond the walls of her beloved library. She is the type of colleague that goes above and beyond and makes everyone around her feel special. From the children with whom she worked tirelessly to foster a love of reading, to the staff she is supportive to in too, too many ways to count, Bunny is and always has been the heart of Canalino. Her beautiful smile, kind heart, and generous spirit will be greatly missed by all. From Diane Paradise, former colleague and fellow Canalino retiree, Bunny was such an integral part of our staff, going far beyond her position as librarian. She embodies her simple reminders to the students and all of us to be kind and to do the right thing. And she laughed a lot. From Mrs. Monica Shugart, Mrs. Lesh has been an amazing friend to all in the library. Two yearly highlights are the reading and review of the books nominated for the California Read Read Young Reader Medal and the relay of volunteers for the Read Across America on Dr. Seuss's birthday. Canalino students have participated for many years in each of these activities due to her organization. Mrs. Lesh has happily shared her passion and enthusiasm for reading. For the Canalino teachers and staff, Mrs. Lesh has organized many of our celebrations of life, marriage, babies, and etc. Her warm and fuzzy personality will be missed at Canalino. From Angela White, teacher, 
Mrs. Lesh has been a quintessential librarian. Students enjoy her reading stories with character voices. She has always appreciated her efforts to find the perfect book to support her classroom curriculum. Melody Aguila, Bunny did a good job making sure each student that had something to say was heard. If it was not the time to share thoughts or comments, Melody's a kindergarten teacher, she made sure that they had the chance to express themselves before they left the library. Mrs. Reyes, or Mrs. Ibarra, she always went over concepts of print in the library and listened to every student who had something to say. Mrs. Edmondson, Mrs. Lesh has welcomed each one of my kindergarten classes with joy and enthusiasm. The students listened to her storytelling voice with a sparkle in their eye and total engagement. She has a special way of taking the children on a literature adventure. Thank you, Bunny, for your dedication and love for literature that you have shared with all of us. And then from Mrs. Marmay, Miss um, Letty, our office coordinator, and Shanna, our counselor, they wanted me to read a poem. It takes a special person to teach a child in class to just keep his attention in a world that moves so fast, to show a child he is new, unique with talents deep inside, to help build his confidence so he can beam with pride, to show a little patience for a child who's lost his way, to a child who feels abandoned, who has seen better days, to inspire and to motivate so a child can learn and grow, to go into this big wide world that has its highs and lows. You, always, you are a special person, you always give your best, and for every child who's been in your class, their life is truly blessed. And we believe this about Bunny Lesh. That's great. so much I appreciate it and I'll cry if I talk so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, y yes I just would like to uh, thank you for uh, a lifetime of teaching and uh, thank you for uh, actually raising our kids to uh, success thank you Th thanks Bunny it, you know you're you're your cherubic personality and and demeanor is is um, it comes out so strong and and um, I know that's going to be missed there, but I know you're going to enjoy spending more time with your horses and your grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Bunny, I think the joy of my day was walking into the library and watching you read a book to children of any age, kindergarten through at one time sixth grade all sitting on the floor, totally in rapture of your reading style to them. So I thank you for teaching lots and lots of children. So I'm also here to recognize um, Alice Bingham. Alice is a Carpentry native and has served her community with a remarkable teaching career for many, of year, many years, some of it, or most of it, at Canalino School. She is the fourth and youngest daughter to, be, to the beloved Me Jean Meacham and mother to Brady and Kylie Bingham, both of whom also graduated from Carpentry High School. Alice is well known and highly respected in the community for her teach stellar teaching career. So I first met Alice Bingham when I began teaching first grade at Canalino in 1999. Alice was teaching the same grade as well, along with 10 other first grade teachers. At the time, Canalino was a K-2 school. I remember Alice putting on fabulous plays even then, and she had a rabbit in her classroom <laughs> who was trained to use a litter box. I found that so interesting. <laughs> Alice taught me much of what I know about being an excellent teacher, and somehow I am now her supervisor. After several years teaching first, then third grade, Alice moved up to fifth grade, and she, Vicki Walton, and I became the fifth grade team at Canalino. Those years were some of the best of my professional career, such was the tight collaboration and mutual respect amongst the three of us. Once I became the principal six years ago, I had the chance to have many more opportunities to see Alice at work in her classroom. 
I am often asked by other educators and parents, how does Alice do it? How does she run a calm, respectful, joyful classroom without a raised voice or any heavy handedness? Her classroom has been and still is a place of complete comfort and safety. She knows each and every student inside out and has incredible intuition. She has eyes everywhere, like all excellent teachers do, and her management of her students is masterful. When pressed on the question of just how she does this, I can only reply, she's just Alice Bingham. <laughs> Alice teaches in such a way that follows the kids' interests. She will teach them to sing many songs and puts on outstanding theatrical performances. Her classroom is simultaneously fun, warm, engaging, while also calm, order, orderly, and structured. Students feel at home in Alice's classroom, and when the school year is over, they are very reluctant to leave. The best way to describe Alice is through the eyes of her former students. From Carter Cox, Mrs. Bingham was probably the warmest teacher I've ever had. She made me feel safe and understood my craziness. I loved when she played music. Every time I hear the song, My Girl, I think of her smiling face. <laughs> Mia Cox, this is a funny one. A memory I have of Miss Bingham was during class. When her class would be working on something independent, she would comb her hair. I don't know why, but I specifically remember her doing that, and I would look over and watch her comb her hair and then go back to work. <laughs> it was just the little things that Miss Bingham did that made her such a good teacher, and I'm so glad I was able to experience them. Uh -huh. Lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> and from their mom, Beth Cox, Alice Bingham was the teacher that was not only destined for her career, but as a parent, you almost wanted to go back to elementary school just to participate in her warm, gentle, heartfelt instruction. She seemed to just get every personality of children and accommodated both the child and the parent. Those who had Ms. Bingham as a teacher were not just lucky, they were blessed. Our thanks and praises for her, to her for touching and transforming so many lives, welcoming and wishing her bliss in her next chapter. From colleague Lisa Nakasoni, to me, she has been an amazing friend and colleague. She's someone I can confide in about my personal struggles and celebrations. When I came back to work after taking a leave of absence, she would pop her head into my little office to check in. She's really been there for me. Lisa says about... Uh, her, Alice teaching both of her children, Sophia and Luke. She was one of the best, endearing, and humorous teachers both of my children ever had. They recall her being an amazing storyteller. She introduced them to some of their favorite books, such as Wonder, Number of the Stars, and The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane. Luke remembered her tape system to keep the class behavior in check, and Sophia enjoyed cleaning the tables with shaving cream. From former student Evan George. Mrs. Bingham, you were such a good teacher to me during my fifth grade year. I remember reading the book Number of the Stars by Lois Lowry. This book and your lessons made me fully aware of the tragedy going on during that time and how we should always do the right thing, even if it's a risk to ourselves. I appreciate the knowledge you imparted to me, and your lessons will stay with me for life. Happy retirement, Evan, Evan George. From his twin sister, Ashley George. I'm so thankful that I was in your fifth grade class back in 2012. Thank you for showing me how to be courageous and allowing my creativity to shine through. I will hold on to all the memories I have of my time with you at Canalino, and I'll never, ever forget you. I hope you had a fun time, have a fun time in your retirement years. And from there, Mom Kelly, your love of teaching has been shown by the way you taught your students and allowed them to be themselves while learning. Thank you for seeing the unique gifts in both Ashley and Evan and for having insight into who they are. They have such fond memories of the time spent in your class, and we are thankful to have ended our time at Canalino with such a supportive teacher. You are a treasure. Congratulations to you, and we miss you much, much happiness in your retirement. From Kate and Charlotte Cooney. Charlotte, uh, Kate, uh, Charlotte's a current student, and Kate was a former student. Together they wrote, Thoughts on Mrs. Bingham. <laughs> Mrs. Bingham is an amazing teacher. In her class we learned so many wonderful things, not just about school, but also how to be leaders, good friends, scholars, and classmates. She always says, if there was one thing I had to teach you guys, it would be how to be an upstander 
and not a bystander. She's a Cat Stevens lover. She also loves Cherry Bomb. Whenever we put a Cat Stevens song, oh man, she sings her heart out. <laughs> Along with the fun times in the classroom, one of the highlights each year are her class plays. Be it Character Matters, Gold Dust or Bust, or Theseus and the Minotaur, each show is unique and spectacular. Each play brought the students of Room 32 into a family, which is something truly special that each student is very lucky to be a part of. We had some laughs together during art. Mrs. Bingham will always be in our hearts. We made some amazing memories together. Charlotte said, My fifth grade class felt like our whole class was a family, and Mrs. Bingham was watching out for every single one of us. I will never forget my favorite teacher, Mrs. Bingham, and neither will the rest of my fifth grade class. From Josie and Dexter Gordon, also twins that she taught. Mrs. Bingham cares for each student and their individuality as learners. The most memorable events in her class were her play productions. Her enjoyment of the plays was infectious. From former student from quite a while ago, Jade Paxton. First, I want to say thank you for all your years you have given to students. You have devoted time to so many. You were my first teacher at Canalino and the most memorable one. You have given me and many others so much knowledge over the years. I hope you have a wonderful retirement. With all my love, Jade Paxton. And from uh, colleague Brianna Dorenzi, who took my place in the fifth grade team. Observing Alice teach is like witnessing magic. The connection and care she has with each, with and for each of her students is unparalleled. When you walk into her classroom, her students are calm, focused, and peaceful. She has a way of creating an environment that ensures that each student knows that he or she is safe, important, and cared for. She incorporates performing arts in her teaching, so school is a place that is engaging and fun for her students. I have the privilege of being mentored by her during my first two years of teaching. She gives the best advice, and her witty sense of humor keeps us all well-grounded. So I personally am fortunate as her friend that Alice will remain in Carpinteria and we will surely rope her into continuing to help us in some capacity, perhaps using her skills in directing theatrical performances. There are not enough ways to describe her illustrious career, and the voices of students, parents, and colleagues capture just a slice of her genius as an educator. Canalino School has been incredibly blessed to have a teacher like Alice serve so many years and so many hundreds of students and families. So congratulations to Alice Bingham. <laughs> Um, I, I don't. I don't want to say anything except thank you. <laughs> it's too hard. <laughs> that, that was that was very that was very touching, Jamie. That, uh, it, uh, I, oh. <laughs> thank you. Alice, those were those are such great accolades that. Um, it, I mean, I know you were you were touched by those, but it, it was just so it's so um, heartwarming to hear so many students from such a wide wide uh, range of years there speak about you with such eloquence, and you know, it it we're we're surely going to miss all of you, um, you know, because you're out you're all all of you are outstanding educators, and and um, hopefully you'll be able to come back and help mentor some of our new, newer teachers and, and, and continue to participate. But, but please enjoy your retirement. It's well-deserved. Um, I definitely remember one day I was in your classroom and the students were working on a report. They were working in small groups, all busily, quietly working on reports. And you turned on some music. And while they would continue to write, they all sang. One boy stood up and played a pretend saxophone. Music stopped, they were, continued to work, and they would never missed a beat. It was amazing to watch. Thank you, Alice. Uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Bingham. And uh, that's correct. You're a treasure as a person and a treasure uh, on education. And thank you on behalf of my daughters. Thank you very much. Okay, well, um, 
we'll move on now to uh, some more recognitions. Yes, and, we do uh, have some more for tonight. Um, I'd like to begin with the high school. Principal Corneo would like to recognize the high school custodians, office staff, instructional assistants, food services, and the grounds and maintenance staff for supporting the high school students during this school year. Each one has provided students with a safe, clean, and well-functioning campus. On behalf of RINCON, Principal Gloger would like to recognize Ryan Reed, a Carpentria community member, for volunteering to coach the RINCON Aztecs basketball team. Ryan's enthusiasm and love for the game are awesome, and his coaching led the Aztecs to a victory at a recent three-on-three basketball tournament in Thousand Oaks. At the middle school, Principal O'Shea would like to recognize Becky Norton. She's our school psychologist for her facilitation of the Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports Anti-Bullying Committee. This committee is developing restorative and logical consequences for student behavior and positive school-wide strategies to support students. At Canalino in the Family School, Principal Pursun would like to recognize the preschool special education team for their preparation and professionalism during the preschool to elementary transition meetings. Their hard work in creating relationships with families and students with IEPs is much appreciated, and it makes a real smooth transition to Canalino for the next school year. At Aliso, Principal Fox would like to recognize Renee Morales and Erica Lee, first grade teachers, for providing opportunities for parents to participate in fun learning activities with their children. Mr. Morales and Mrs. Lee have hosted four literacy nights throughout the year, which brought families in the community together to celebrate reading. Their most recent literacy night at the Carpinteria Public Library hosted almost 100 participants. They're also working to celebrate diverse cultures in our school and community by hosting a cultural night, which is tonight, which is why Aliso's not here tonight, for families with a follow-up assembly for Aliso students. And then at Summerlin, Principal Fox would like to recognize Chris Karpenko, who's the Aliso office coordinator for her flexible support to Summerlin throughout this school year. She has worked with Summerlin teachers, staff, and families to provide translation services for parent meetings and daily communications. We appreciate her flexibility and willingness to help when needed at another school site. Great, thank you. Um, so we'll move right into your, super, your report. Thank you. So I'd like to continue with the appreciation. Uh, the State Department has designated that the third week of May is classified school employee week, and we would like to recognize and indicate how grateful we are for the dedication and contributions to our schools by our own classified employees. We also would like to add our congratulations to Ms. Elise Unruh, the performing arts teacher at the high school. As you heard earlier, she received the Santa Barbara Teachers Federal Credit Union Crystal Apple Educator, Educator Award for her innovative curriculum, effective instruction, and teacher leadership. So congratulations, Elise. Um, the Santa Barbara Teachers Network also awarded grants to uh, the following teachers, Madison Maple and Jan Silk at the Family School, Mandy DeWitt, Sarah Rocklitzer, Deb Joseph, and Van Latham at the high school. And then I have some updated information regarding the governor's budget, the May revision, and this is directly from school services. While the governor retains most of his proposals from January, the May revision budget does make several changes to some of the governor's education proposals, including making a deposit in the public school system stabilization account, changes to the full-day kindergarten expansion program, and modest increases to his California state teacher's retirement system and special education proposals. So I'm just going to go through some of the items uh, for your information. Regarding Proposition 98, the revised 1920 state budget includes a modest increase in Proposition 98 funding from $80.7 billion was in the January proposal, and now it's at $81.1 billion. For the public school system stabilization account, there is a required deposit of, of $389 million. For LCFF, the COLA adjustment has decreased from 3.46% in January to, uh, in May, it's 3.26%. For special ed, increase the funding from $576 million to $696 million to support expanded special ed services and school readiness supports at LEAs with high percentages of both students with disabilities and unduplicated students. For the CalSTRS payment, $3 billion, one-time non-Proposition 98 general fund payment to CalSTRS to reduce the long-term liabilities for employers. The employee, 
or a contribution rate is reduced from 18.13% to 16.7% for next school year. Regarding the full-day kindergarten facilities, in January, Governor Newsom proposed an additional $750 million one-time non-Proposition 98 funds to assist schools in constructing or retrofitting facilities to expand access to full-day kindergarten programs. That has been reduced to $600 million, but will also provide greater fiscal incentive and support for districts to participate in the program by increasing the state share of the facility grant from 50 to 75 percent. There were some uh, recommended uh, statutory changes to charter schools. And then with this current information as of today, the only change to our budget projections is the CalSTRS reduction in the employee contribution rate. So that gives us an increased revenue of $43,000. The reduction in expenditures? Yeah, expenditures, yes. For the 1920 staffing, we are completing the recruitment and hiring process for replacement certificated staff for 1920, and the remaining openings are a bilingual assistant principal for the middle school and a preschool special education teacher. We continue to recruit for special education instructional assistants. Spring musicals. <laughs> I hope you did not miss the, the high school's performance of Beauty and the Beast. Outstanding. I think the audiences were totally entertained four nights with our really talented students. It was fabulous. And we're looking forward to Disney's Lion King by Summerland, June 7th and 8th, Friday night and Saturday, right? Be held at Main School. Don't miss it. And then for Measure U, we're really excited because this summer is really Incredible construction is going to be taking place in the three campuses, Aliso, Canalino, and the high school, begin June 17th. So because of that significant activity, teachers and staff are working really hard to pack up all their classrooms and remove all their items. So school, the last day of school is June 13th, and June 14th, we're moving those boxes to storage. And on Saturday, June 15th, the construction staff will be on site. And it'll be busy all summer long, and we're, we are told that they will be done in time for us to return on August 19th. So let's just hope it's really good weather <laughs> and those schedules are not interrupted because we have everybody returning August 19th. And the modernizations of those classrooms will continue through 2020. And then we're also finalizing the coastal development permit with the County of Santa Barbara for the Summerlin Project. That's a big report. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll move on to E5, and we have a presentation, um, an annual report and presentation of, of the uh, family school, and Principal Pursun is here. I'm back. <laughs> so I also have um, with us today, we have uh, John Steinman, who's the treasurer, I believe, for the parent support group and longtime supporter of the Carpentry Family School. He's got his second child coming through. She'll be in fifth grade next year. And I just roped John into um, helping chaperone the Simi trip in the, in September. So thanks for that, for John. And then we have Jan Silk and Lori Lee, who are longtime teachers and you stewards. You don't have to rope people into that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> no. I know. I'm just giving him lots of credit. So we're here tonight to talk about the Carpentry Family School. We're submitting a rep an annual report to the um, California Department of Education about family school for school programs of choice. So we just wanted to update you on where we are for family school. And I enjoyed some of the pictures I was able to put in there um, of all the adventures that our students have been having this school year. So the mission statement of the school, Carpentry of Family School is a cooperative community of students, educators, and parents dedicated to a safe, nurturing, and creative learning environment. Our multi-age classrooms cultivate intrinsically motivated individuals who are contributing compassionate members of our local and global communities. Parent participation is at the heart of our school and crucial in encouraging our children to reach their own unique potential. Carpentry of Family School honors diversity, inspires the whole child through social, emotional, and challenging academic experiences, laying a foundation for developing creative, critical thinkers and lifelong learners. So as part of this, uh, mission, this vision and mission process that the family school went through probably about 2011, I believe, 2011, 2000, right before I um, became the principal of Canalino because we were doing it 
Catalina was doing it uh, about a year before, we, they came up with a number of value statements. So an emphasis on the whole child is one of them by embracing individuality and creating a safe, loving environment where everyone is respected and heard. Children can flourish academically. A multi-age classroom, so it's a philosophy of the school by choice and not by necessity. So some combination classes we make by necessity based on numbers. Children are perceived less in terms of their grade and more in terms of their unique qualities and capabilities. Academics, the value statement, students become proficient learners through emphasis on state standards, cooperative and project-based learning, and a supportive environment that embraces all the core philosophies. Community, Carpentry Family School has a strong partnership with our local community that facilitates student, educator, and parent engagement and community service, as well as welcoming the community into our school. And I've seen this happen quite a lot in the Family Fridays, when the school gathers together on Fridays for about 45 minutes, and we have had the Channel Keepers, we've had Holly Lohais, we've had quite a few um, community organizations come in with the students and the staff. Compassion, the school embraces Marshall Rosenberg's nonviolent communication, and we are uh, we finished three sessions, evening sessions, that's open to all district parents and open to the community, and the fourth session will be this coming Monday for the training for the NVC. And that's supported by the parent group, by the way, that brings that training to the community. Parent participation, so here's Chris, Rosita, and Mimi Power um, at the most recent Bike to School Day on May 8th. Parent participation is an integral part of a multi-age classroom and family-style community. In striving for 100% participation for parents, they are encouraged to volunteer and bring their own unique talents and ideas into our school. The tribe philosophy is how the, the parent group organizes the various roles that the parents take on through cooperation and connection. Tribes work on team building and planning the success and the sustainability of the school community. So another um, unique thing about the Carpentry Family School is environmental sustainability and stewardship, education, awareness, and practice. Our students and their families learn the importance of protecting the environment. And I included some photos that Lori sent me of a, of a um, salt marsh field trip the student, her fourth and fifth grade students had gone on. Those are some of our Carpentry of Family School parents and their children at our recent May 15th family picnic lunch for the whole campus. And then again, there's the, the Grit Boy Brothers with Lori Lee. And they do for um, Bike to School Day and Walk to School Day, Lori leads a, a group of students from both Canalino and Carpentry of Family School from Memorial Park, which is where they meet, and then they ride over to the campus on those days. So the essential mission of any school is teaching and learning, so we wanted to take a look. Um, if you have the copy of the report, too, you don't need to look at it now, but um, it goes into a little bit more depth, and we have some charts and numbers for you to look at. Uh, I did a high-level analysis for this PowerPoint. So overall achievement for all students in language arts, um, there is an increase in number of students meeting the standard when looking at the cohort that was in third grade in 15-16, through fifth grade in last year's state testing of 1718. So that particular group of students did increase in its scores in, in language arts. What I, one of my caveat to that is in looking at the three year data, we're talking about a very small group of students for each grade level, between 10 to 14, depending on the grade and in the year. So percentages are somewhat skewing because it doesn't really rec it really, really have to look kid by kid when you have such small sample sizes. Um, I, really, I really learned that because I look at, at Canalino students where I've got 530 <coughs> of them. It's really different than looking at you know 12 students in a grade rather than like 120 students in a grade. So one or two students moving categories from standard exceeded to standard met or standard met to nearly met or to not met significantly changes the percentages. It's more beneficial, as I said, to look at individual students and how they are progressing on local assessment data in the six-week increments, especially the four times of year that we do those formal assessments that are local indicators in the beginning of the year, November, March, and May. So that's where we really take all of our data. 
um, to look at how our students are doing. So from a high level analysis, the fifth grade group improved their overall performance in English language arts from the previous year, and we're talking about last year's test scores. For example, when the students were in fourth grade, 25% met the standard, whereas when they were fifth graders, 46% met the standard. Also, when they were in fourth grade, 41.67% nearly met the standard, whereas in fifth grade, we had moved those students to met, and only 25% were nearly met. So we moved some of those students up, and, and that's actually only probably about two or three students. Research and inquiry and writing are areas for growth in looking at the overall subcategories for assessment across the grades. And actually, we just had a uh, school site council slash parent board meeting on Tuesday, I believe. And Lori was sharing with us how much growth that she has seen in her students' writing this year with the new ReadyGen curriculum. So the ReadyGen curriculum we have for fourth and fifth grade is very rigorous and it has really improved the students' writing. And she's gotten a lot of comments from parents about how much they're seeing in their students' writing skills based on our new curriculum. So that's promising. For overall achievement in mathematics, there was an overall increase in students who did not meet the standard. However, it is only one or two students that affected this number. In looking at last year's fifth grade class, 50% of the group overall, sco overall scored either below or near standard in fourth grade math, so the previous year. Um, we had three students last year in the 4-5 combination that came into that class um, and for the first year and then left. So they were only there for one year, and all three of those students were in the not met category, and they're no longer at the school. So that kind of a little skewed the numbers. Um, so let's see. In 2017 and 18, as fifth graders, 41.647 of the group scored below or near standard this means about 8% or one student moved up to MET standard. And for all of our scores, communicating reasoning is an overall area for growth, and I can say that that's true in pretty much every grade. Um, that has to do with the mathematics, the explain why you think so, or why was that your answer, or how did you figure that out? So we're, we're working with students year by year to continue to build those articulation skills. It's really actually a writing and reasoning skill in addition to a math skill. So that's something we're working on. So like I said, we um, really focus on our local assessment indicators to see how our students are doing. So in this year's, uh, we looked at, at these in depth at our school site council meeting a couple of months, or about March when we were collecting data for report cards and conferences. So there are 12 kindergarten students, three of whom are significantly below standard in recognizing lower and uppercase letters as well, in produce, as, well as producing the sounds. They are likewise below standard in sight words, identifying numbers to 20, writing numbers to 21, and counting to 100. So these students are students we're watching closely um, and carefully uh, trying to analyze what is happening with those students, and they're getting additional support with um, the, the certificated teacher and the classroom instructional assistant. In the first grade group of 12 students, there is one student who is significantly below standard in many areas, and four students who are somewhat below standard. Seven of the 12 students are at or exceeding standard for the second trimester. So the teacher and I go over each and every student um, when we go th through these results and figure out what the next step interventions are going to be, the curriculum that she's going to use, and, the very, and bring in the parent as well for the conferences to see what's going on with those students. For second grade, our universal screening tool is Dibbles or a fluency test, which actually is very correlated to language arts success overall. So in second grade, um, Jan Silk's class, three students exceeded the standard, six students on standard, two students near standard, two students below standard, and one student at risk. Um, and that student is being as assessed for special education this year. So we generally would wait a few years to provide intervention before we do a special education assessment, and um, that student is in second grade and will be, be is being assessed. Third grade dibbles, three students exceeded standard, four students on standard, one near, and one below. And we do have a student with an IEP that is um, below standard in that class. So he also gets um, assistance in... The, from a special education teacher 
every day. Fourth and fifth grade dibbles, 20 students meeting or exceeding standard, and five approaching the standard. So nobody below standard in that class, in that group. For the writing assessment, 23 students are meeting or exceeding standards. So that's actually incredibly imp impressive because those are really high level tests. So great job to Lori and um, her instructional assistants and students. Two students in that class are approaching the standard. And this is at trimester two, so they ha that's not the end of your data yet. And then fourth and fifth grade unit four test bridge, the bridges test, the math curriculum. So we just looked at the, the latest uh, unit they had finished for tr reporting at trimester two. 20 students are meeting or exceeding standard, four students approaching the standard, and one student below the standard in math. We also wanted to look at culture and climate and the report to the state asks that we look at what parents they're thinking and what students are thinking. And so we used the California Healthy Kids Survey data and I was really pleased to have 51 respondents. There's only 66 kids, so to have 51 respondents was very good. I was a little bit naggy on the parents' grid for people to take it, but I really wanted their feedback. So 35% of the respondents are white, 22% Hispanic or Latino, 20% two or more races, and 16% declined to state. 12% of those responding did qualified for free and reduced lunch, and 88% do not qualify for free and reduced lunch. This is all reported out in the California Healthy Kids Survey um, that is posted on our website, and I believe has already been presented to you, um, the results of the various schools and the overall for the district. So overall, the parent feedback is very positive across all of our indicators. I did pull out um, the student as well. So it was 11 fifth grade respondents. So again, when you look at the percentages, consider that each kid is, is about eight or nine percent. So a huge strength in the survey was students' perception of their academic performance. So 27 percent felt they were one of the best students. And 36 percent felt they are better than most students. 36 percent felt that they are about the same as others. And none of the students felt that they were not as good as other students. So I was really happy to see that. That's positive self-image and that's really important for achievement. Um, there's a strong perception of safety on the part of the fifth grade student respondents and the parents. So everybody feels very safe on the campus and within the classroom. And that's also true for the Canalino students and parents as well. So we're doing a good job with safety at the campus. One challenge area um, for the family school is that 45% of students reported they had missed one school day in the last 30 days. So regular attendance continues to be a challenge for the family school population. Um, we tend to have uh, students that go on vacations or things like that during the school year. So I've been doing a lot of messaging this year about the importance of regular attendance and I do send out the monthly um, letters for any unexcused or unverified absences. So those go out, um, and we, do, we are trying to message that attendance is really crucial and inextricably linked to academic, social, and emotional success. One of the things that stood out to me is the statement, now these are, you, the California Healthy Kids Survey questions are the same across, and it's always trying to figure out how the kids interpreted the question. So the statement was, adults at the school make an effort to get to know me. 27% said this was all the time, 45% this was most of the time, and 27% said this was some of the time. So I, I'm not quite sure if, if how they interpreted the word adults. I would imagine they did not mean their teachers because they are, they are very tightly knit with their classrooms, but they do interact with about, let's see, 12 instructional assistants at yard duties, art teachers, things like that. So I'm not quite sure how they interpreted it, but it's something we could certainly improve upon for students perceiving people are trying to get to know who they are. And this happens every year. Students, The statement that students get to help decide activities and rules, 18% responded that no, they do not. Um, so sometimes that is the case. They do not get to design the, the rules. But we are working on the activities. And Ms. Shanna, who was here earlier, is really active with the, the student council. And they we meet weekly. And we have um, representatives from the family school on that as well. And they are deciding some of our activities and events that happen on campus. 
Also, another question that I see pretty much every year is one of the uh, concern areas. Do teachers ask you what you want to learn about? 64% of the respondents in the fifth grade say no, they do not. And I would say that's probably true because we do use a curriculum that is fairly set in what we're teaching. Um, but we can certainly brainstorm some ideas about how to get some student interest and how, how to help, help them drive the curriculum a little bit more as we look at that data. Another one that uh, caught my eye, students try to stop bullying when they see it happen, happening. So 27% said no, never, which means that you know, 93, or not 93, 63, 73 said that it uh, does happen. But I was, even if it's just three students that reported that, I'm a little concerned there. I think it's problematic if they feel that students are not helping to try to stop bullying. So that's something that I think we can work on. So our curriculum at the Carpentry Family School is the same as any other elementary classroom in Carpentry Unified School District. For kindergarten through third grade, we use the Wonders English Language Arts curriculum. So Jan's class and Ms. Maple's class are both using that. And then the four or five classes, as I just said, uses ReadyGen. And it's really lovely because Jan and Lori are on a campus with a number of teachers at that same grade level and can collaborate with them on Wednesdays so that they can have, work with each other to implement the curriculum. The FOSS Science, both Jan and Lori are champions of science and have been in participating in all the iterations of science professional development over the years, Science Matters, um, this, what are we calling the other, the new, the new one, the South Coast Science Project? There's all kinds of different things that have, both of them have been leaders in science for years. So this year, Jan, or last year, Jan piloted actually um, the FOSS curriculum, and they were writing about their crayfish that they hatched in their classroom. And Lori has done all three of the units this year. So both of them really integrate science into their classroom, which is related to the value statement of the environmental sustainability and investigation so we really appreciate their leadership there um, and then the math uh, is bridges and we are beginning to see a lot of progress with math and uh, a lot of that is due to the hard work of the teachers but also because we are in year three of um, the bridges math curriculum and it does really change the way that we have taught math and it's really more reasoning based and building concept of number before you do operations and so the teachers are starting to notice especially in the upper grades the fruits of our labor as they the students get that type of teaching from year to year so I think we're only going to see improvement in our math scores as we continue to use the bridges program so there's a couple of our friends um, in the library checking out some nonfiction titles so address, to address positive relationships on campus, um, this is, you know, in the past there's been some controversy and conflict with the family school and Canalino being on the same campus. And some of the things we've done to address that, um, and both Jan and Lori were part of our committee last, was that last year? Two years ago we had Jared come and help facilitate um, a plan for, from both Canalino staff and Carpentry Family School staff. Collaborative communities, yes. So one of the things that has helped is we're in the second year of having one principal for both schools on the shared site. So that's really helped a lot. Um, shared math support for fifth graders from the Carpentry Family School 4-5 combo and the Canalino 4-5 combo. So because we have two 4-5s on the campus, we have a highly, highly um, skilled instructional assistant slash UCLA double major grad with math. Uh, Linda Callender, um, who also teaches piano, so there's your music and math connection. Uh, she is helping us with the fifth grade math and absolutely knocking it out of the park. So we've combined those two groups of fifth graders together. And um, it's not just the math that we've seen improve so much. It's the relationships between the students. Because they're in class together, they get to know each other, and it's just providing some crossover for part of the day that has helped a lot. Also, that the, we have PE support helping give professional development to our teachers, and our teachers go out in, in, class, in groups of two classes. So Lori goes out with um, Mrs. Marmay's 4-5 class, and then Jan goes out with Monica Shugart's four, four, five, or th third grade class, and sharing those times and having kids play together and do the games together has really helped. 
All of our assemblies on campus and all of the science-based field trips are shared and they're common amongst both schools. And this year, this was a new thing this year, and this was, you know, Diana's vision to have the same science field trip for all fifth graders. And so that hadn't happened before. And they went together, Carpinteria Family School and Catalino, at the very beginning of the year to Catalina Island. And that really just set the foundation and I give Lori a lot of credit for that, and, and Alice, Vicki, and the other fifth grade teachers set the foundation for a collaborative community um, for the whole rest of the year. And not only just the students and the staff, but then a lot of the parents from both schools got to know each other while bunking together and putting on wetsuits out in Catalina Island for three days. So it was really positive. We share our systems of reading intervention and our tiered social and emotional support. So our counselor, Start therapist and psychologist are shared amongst the two schools and as well as the reading intervention. So some of those students that you saw on the below standard are um, seeing our reading intervention folks as well. And then student participation and leadership as I mentioned on student council. So I liked this shot because um, it's it's prisoner ball. It's not my favorite name in the world, but it's prisoner ball, very popular in the last two or three months, kind of a hotbed of conflict at times. But that's a group of students that are both from Canalino and Carpentry Family School. So in the past, I would say three years ago, students were playing fairly separately. Um, they weren't playing the games together, and they were kind of not not hanging out together. And now it's pretty integrated. Would you not say across the campus? Yeah, it's very integrated. There's not really a division between the two things. So I was, I'm happy to see that. I'm not saying there's no conflict because it has nothing to do with school. It's, you know, if you called me out and I wasn't out or that was out or lots of prisoner ball stuff. <laughs> so that uh, classroom over there on the left-hand side is Jan's class, I believe, in our new Gen 7s. So another fabulous thing that happened this year to the family school is we have all three classrooms together for the first time in their school history right next to each other in the new Gen 7 buildings. So that's been lovely as well. And the picture on the right is all the folks that were going to be moving into the Gen 7s. They got a tour right before we got to move in in October. Um, and I think everybody in the Gen 7 wing uh, really works closely together. Um, it just, I think the family school staff and the Canalino staff have really integrated to work together all across the board. So the way I describe it to people is that it's a unique school. The family school is a unique school that exists on a collaborative campus. So it has historically had three classrooms scattered throughout, and then we got the new classrooms that are together. So there's a community feel amongst the small school, while at the same time being part of a collaborative campus of over 600 students and over 90 staff members. So this balance is increasingly successful with intentional efforts on, beha on behalf of all the stakeholders. So we're all very mindful about both recognizing each school's individuality, um, and that's happened this year with dual language immersion because that has an individual individuality to it as a program, and yet all of the programs work together to be a collaborative campus. And having one principle for all of that really does um, facilitate that happening. So I think we've made an enormous amount of progress and collaboration in the last three or four years. Would you guys agree? Absolutely. Yeah. It feels wonderful. Yeah. So everybody's honored for their part. And so I ended with that because that's what we just took for our collaborative yearbook between the two schools, the fifth grade yearbook. And that's a picture of all of our fifth graders from both Canalino and Carpinteria Family School. And I get up on a ladder. Lori got a little nervous and wanted me to wear a helmet. <laughs> Because Peter puts a big ladder up there, and then I climb all the way up and take a picture. So I think we've um, been successful. So some conclusions and recommendations, and you'll read this in more length at the report. Um, while the um, overall academic achievement is strong, uh, our goal is for 100% of students to meet and exceed grade level standards, which we have not yet achieved. Um, in analysis of individual students, because we do have the ability with the sample size to look at each and every student, there are some of the challenges are with social and emotional behavior, which interfe interferes with their learning. Um, in response to this, we're going to augment our existing tiered social system of social and emotional support, 
And the next bullet tells us how you're going to do that. So all three classrooms next school year will fully implement the second step social and emotional curriculum program and adopted and purchased by the school district this year. So it's lessons on how to work well and play well with others, control your feelings, um, things like that. So a series of lessons delivered by the certificated teacher will ensure students have access to instruction in these areas at the tier one level. Tier one meaning it goes to everybody. And I will be the one monitoring the implementation and its success with students in coordination with the school-based counselor who will be supporting that curriculum. So I will continue to work with each classroom to ensure a highly structured, organized, and calm classroom environment in which all students are extremely clear on the expectations for behavior. And students need to know what they are supposed to know and be able to do at all times in the classroom. Students who struggle to be on task will be coached and supported with interventions like a visual daily schedule and monitoring charts between home and school, implementation of strategies for positive behavioral support, and meetings with families to ensure everyone understands what it looks and sounds like to be a productive member of a classroom. So one of our challenges this year is we've had um, a series of substitute or short-term psychologists. Our psychologist has not been there this year. So we've had a, at a maximum two days a week of a psychologist so um, we are really excited because we have hired a very qualified individual to be a full-time psychologist at our campus for our 600 and some students. And I really look forward to her being able to help us with some of our students who are displaying significant needs for social and emotional support. Great, thank you. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see the collaboration and the structure and that, that but also that that the family school has been able to maintain its its own identity because I know that was a con concern amongst many, and it seems like you know we, we've been successful in in achieving that. Um, so congratulations to to all of you on that, um, and and uh, it, you can see it in the happy faces in these mm -hmm. pictures. Um, one of the questions I had was um, uh, the kindergarten. Um, readiness mm -hmm. uh, uh, or, or achievement. Is that, are, is that a, a new, um, I mean, are, compared to previous years, are we yes. seeing, are we seeing um, less preparedness at kindergarten compared to other, other years as far as the, the, the uh, you know, not the dibbles, but the, uh, there was one slide there where you, you had three or yeah, four we students have, yep. that were significantly yes. below standard. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if we've seen that in the past or if that's a new trend. Well, it's my second year as the principal. This is uh, unique to these three specific students. Okay. Um, and we're working with social services, the psychologist, special education on those, on those three students. And sometimes students take a little bit, a little while to get going, but <coughs> we, we are working on those specific students. In terms of readiness overall, looking at the kindergarten, it's, I think we're increased on the readiness for with the KSEP as our tool, the kindergarten yep. student entrance profile. But those three specific students we are working on. And we do have a new teacher in that class. This is her first year, the K-1 teacher, Miss Maple, the marvelous Miss Maple. Um, and so, yeah, we, it's something we have our eye on. Okay, great. Did, did they attend preschool, those three students? Mm, yes. Somehow just missed. But out we're, on we, I mean, you're obviously aware of it. I just, I, I just was curious if, if, because um, um, we, I, I don't think we'd seen that in the past. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's just a kind of an anomaly at this point. Yeah. One is behavioral. Okay. And another one has some. And we haven't uh, no IEPs in, yet. Not yet. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. That was a thank you. Great report. Great. So before you sit down, yes, um, uh, I'd like to start with you and commend you, Jamie, for facilitating the intentional activities to increase the collaboration amongst the staff. Great job. And then I'd also like to commend Microphone. Lori Lee and Jane. Oh, sorry. And Jan and the marvelous Mrs. Maple <laughs> for um, providing such joyful classrooms in which students are very productive. So congratulations. It's always my pleasure to visit your classrooms. And kudos to the parents for their wonderful participation because mm -hmm. that does make a difference. So we're really excited 
about the learning that's going on, the teaching and learning at the family school. So thank you all. Thank you. I'd like, I'd like to thank you, John, uh, for your, your massive participation um, mm-hmm. in, in the effort. And uh, I know it's appreciated by staff. So thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Great job. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't believe we have any public comment. So we'll move on to uh, F Board Policies. Um, F1 is Board Policy and Administrative Regulation 5113.1, Chronic Absence and Truancy, First Reading. Can I get a motion? I move to approve um, F1. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, F2 is Board Policy and Administrative, administrative Regulation 5125, Student Records, First Reading. Can I get a motion there? I move to approve F2. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, uh, nothing for uh, education <coughs> services, so we'll move on to H, Business Operations Facility and Warrants. Uh, we're being asked to approve warrants for the period of uh, May 10th through the 23rd in the amount of $326,618.84. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, uh, we have two gifts tonight. Um, one is a uh, donation from Rincon Engineering to Carpenter High School Robotics Club in the amount of $500. And the other is a donation from the Carpenter Morning Rotary to the uh, Future Farmers of America for $1,000. Can I get a motion to approve? I move to approve H2A and H2B. Second. Um, just like to thank both Rincon Engineering and the Carp Morning Rotary. Thank you. All those in favor? Always. Aye. Thank you. Aye. Aye. Okay, move on to H3 and um, a continuation of our budget study session. Monica, if we could start with page four. I just want to remind everyone that we developed the budget to support the resources that are needed to achieve the district goals which are to increase student learning, promote safe and respectful schools, develop our budgets to support the educational programs while maintaining sustainability, increasing the efficiency and effectiveness of the district operations, as well as building community support and engagement. And then we have core principles identified on page five as we develop the budget, reminding everybody that students and their learning are at the center of our decisions, teaching and learning conditions matter for student success, and the resources that we're requesting for program services and activities reflect our core values of academic achievement, respectful community, and continuous improvement. And then part of the sustainability is in our board policy 3100, we have identified the minimum fund balance, which is the board intends to maintain a minimum unassigned fund balance, which includes a reserve for economic uncertainties equal to at least 10% of operating expenditures. Thank you. And then um, uh, on page seven, just want to remind everyone what our schedule is. Uh, uh, tonight, I will just review um, the information that you've seen before, but with the changes from the May revision, which is the $43,000 less of expenditures due to the CalSTRS um, contribution from the governor's May revise budget recommendation. We're currently working on revising the LCAP. On June 11th, there will be a public hearing for the uh, presented budget as well as the LCAP. And then on June 25th, by June 25th, we'll know what the June 15th uh, state budget, what it, what it entails, because it will, it's required to be passed by June 15th. So June 25th, we'll have all the final figures for the budget for 1920 as well as the LCAP. So if you turn to page 8, we've updated this slide, you'll see that on CalSTRS, it's now 16.7% for 1920. 
It was 18.93%. It's now down to 16.7%. There is some discussion at the Senate level that the recommendation is 16.33 to further reduce it, but they're in committee right now. So um, we know for sure it'll be reduced to at least 16.7, and it could still be decreased. The other discussion point that I learned about today is CalPERS, which is not in the governor's uh, recommendation. However, it was discussed both in the Assembly and the Senate, and so there is some um, suggestion that CalPERS will be reduced as well. But we won't know that until um, the final budget is signed on June 15th. So as a result of that information, page 9, we've updated um, the STIRS for the certificated in the sample cost to district positions. Uh, page 10 continues to be the same, and that is our property tax history. So we are projected um, to receive $23,377,722, which is a 5.02% increase. Page 11 reflects what our uh, staffing was for 1819. Then when you turn to page 12, you'll see that uh, for 1920, we've implemented the reductions. I'd just like to review them again. For teachers, it's 1.2 FTE. For instructional assistants, 0.94 FTE. For library media techs, 1.5. For the tech support specialist, that's 0.32. Clerical support, 0.5 FTE. And for custodians, 1.97 FTE. And we're in the process of determining, working with all the employees for their bumping rights and what positions they have access to for next year. The, the next page that was updated is uh, page 16. So this is our unrestricted general fund. So our preliminary budget uh, revenue is $21.3 million, and our expenditures are $21.4. So we're still deficit spending about $69,448. We updated uh, also um, slide 17, page 17. This is the total general fund history of five years. So our total, what were our preliminary budget for 1920, our total general fund will be $29,727,946. Our expenditures are higher at $29,797,188. So that reflects the deficit spending of 69242 with an ending funding balance of $2.6 million. So that reserve percentage is about 6.27%. Um, if you look at the past five years before 2018, so you look at 2014, 15, 6, 15, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18, the average for the reserve has been about 8.8%. So we're getting closer to that 10%. And then on page 18, we have our special education. And what is notable about this slide is that the increase has been, in the last five years, $1.5 million, so that's 68% increase of expenditures. Our revenue is only $1.5 million, yet our expenditures are 5.4, which requires us then to contribute from the general fund $3.8 million. So then we move to pages 21, 22, and 23. They are all updated because they reflect the current um, 43,000 less in expenditures. Those are the pie charts. But we'll now turn to page 25 because that reviews the unrestricted revenue budget assumptions. So our actuals for 1819 are 
$341,734. Our property tax increases that we're projecting are $1,117,390. We get an increase to the Education Protection Account, $13,087. Um, $8,222 change to the federal revenue. So that, that's on the, um, that is contributing to the revenue. To the adding to the property tax, but then we had to we had changes in state revenue, so we were reduced because of our um, decreasing enrollment thirty one thousand fifty dollars, and that's the lottery and the uh, block grant mandate. You recall we received one time money, uh, three hundred eighty four thousand four hundred twelve dollars, and actually that was not in the governor's budget, nor was it in the May revision, or is it going to is it expected? So there'll be no one time money from the state. We also reduced our local revenue because we had a one-time Thomas file claim of $301,264. We had a one-time rebate for work, workman's comp at $128,856. And then there's one house on Baylord. We have three renters, but of the three renters, one will not be rented is $43,978. And then we had to increase our contribution to special education, $232,748. And so our projected 1920 unrestricted revenues are $21,331,950, which is about $9,784 less than last year. So essentially our revenues are going down when your, expense, your expenditures or expenses always increase. And then these are our unrestricted budget drivers. You've seen these before. Uh, what has changed, of course, is the CalSTRS. So our step and column increases are about $191,625. Health and welfare is at 2.04%, is not 790, excuse me, $79,057. And then our pension increases, $55,411 for CalSTRS. $128,976 for CalPERS. We're expecting a 5% utilities increases, $35,266. And then our property and liability went up, and that was due to the disasters. It went up 25%. So that's $57,002. So our unrestricted budget drivers are already 2.5% higher than last year, and that's $547,337. And keep in mind, this does not include any cost of living adjustments for collective bargaining. And that's $191,004 for 1%. So then we look at page 27, which has been updated. And we have our unrestricted budget expenditures at estimated actuals for 1819 at $21,922,068. You add those budget drivers at 2.5%, which is $547,337. We were able to make some savings with retirement savings, and there are substitutes that we have this year for leave of long-term leave of absences that we're not going to have for next year. So we're able to have a $258,875,000 savings. And then we made those budget reductions at 809132 So our unrestricted expenditures are at $21,401,398. So that is a decrease expenditures 2.38% over last year. And then you've seen page 28 before. That's our list of the budget reductions that add up to $809,132. So in page 29, we put it all together. We have our projected unrestricted 1929, uh, 1920 revenue. So we are expecting $21,331,950. We are projecting 1920 expenditures at $21,401,398. We're expecting that our ending fund balance for the estimated actuals for 1819 will be $1,938,522. 
So we have a um, decrease to the unrestricted fund balance at 69448 So our projected reserve of the $1.8 million is 6.27%. And at 1819, it was 6.37%. So we also updated uh, slide number 30, and again, that's the total general fund, and that's the preliminary general fund budget, 1920, which indicates the rev total revenues are 29.7 million, the ex expenditure is 29.6, and the um, deficit will be $69,243. And then the ending balance, 2.6 million, and the components of the ending balance. And that's also reflected on page 31 with the estimated actuals in the preliminary budget. So if you turn to page 32, you'll see what our map is for the multi-year plan. We have our 1819 estimated actuals with revenues of 29.9, expenditures 30.3, uh, deficit 503,917 and a reserve of 6.37 percent. Preliminary 1920 budget, revenues 29.7, expenditures 29.6, um, deficit spending $69,242, ending fund balance 2.6 million with a 6.27 percent reserve. And then you uh, project out to 2021 and 2122. The reserves are 7.98%, and then increase 11.64%. And so the average of 2021 20, and 22 is about 8.6. And then for the past five years, we're 8.8. .8. So we are pretty much within the same that we've done in the past five years. Again, we still want to be closer to 10%. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so, again, that 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 this this um, this does not take into consideration any cola for uh, the collective bargaining unit. Yeah. It does not. Yeah. Are you still comfortable with the uh, with the reductions that we set forth at our last meeting? That we've plugged in here? I think they're challenging, but I think it's important that we, uh, for budget reasons and a sustainable budget, that we have to make that level of cut. But not additional? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay. So you're not recommending any additional cuts? No. Okay. Any, any other comments, questions? I'd, no, really? that's fine. No? I'd, I just, you know, one thing that really stands out to me in here. Um, that it has for some time is the, um, uh, I think it's on page uh, 15, history of pension increases. If you go back to 1314, we were contributing about a million, about a, about a million uh, two towards pensions, and this year we're contributing. Um, over three and a half million yes. dollars, so we have a you know two point uh, three million dollar uh, increase that that which when we originally um, when we were originally looking at at that proposal from the from the uh, from Calpers and Calsters uh, back in twenty eleven or twenty twelve the projection was in seven years we would be spending a million dollars more. Over in that period, and and uh, we're not done yet, um, according to the the, the uh, schedule of increases. Um, sounds like there's a little reprieve, uh, not not significant, um, but that, I think that's, you know, when people ask why our um, why our budget is, you know, we continue to see these increases in our property tax revenues, but we. We, we aren't we aren't getting ahead and I keep pointing out to them that that we have this basically uncontrolled increase in our uh, pension contributions as well as um, our increase in our health um, 
health insurance contributions. So in in thirteen, well in ten and ten eleven, we were we were contributing um, about a thousand dollars per employee, and um, this year we're contributing uh, sixteen hundred um, yes. dollars a month, and and uh, I believe it's uh, so basically it, it went from uh, about twelve thousand a little over twelve thousand dollars a year to close to t- just under twenty thousand dollars a year um, which is significant when you're talking you know close to 300 employees mm-hmm. yeah and 86 percent of your budget is yeah so so budget. if you have if you have uh, say say we're you know I don't think I can't I don't know the exact number but just say there's um, 250 employees and and we're, we've had an increase of uh, about seven thousand dollars per employee. Um, there's a million and almost a million and a half dollars right there in increases that we really, do, uh, you know, because of our collective bargaining agreement, um, we don't have any control over. So if you add that uh, million and a half to the 2.2 million in pension increases, you know, we're just under seven million or uh, just under four million dollars in, in, um, you know, in drivers that we don't have any control over. So it's it's um, and, and not to mention that we've we've seen about a fifteen percent um, over that period of time fifteen percent increase in in um, in salaries. So it's um, there's a lot of things that um, are contributing to this to this to our budget uh, deficit. But fortunately, we're in a lot better shape than schools that um, that are are stuck with the. Um, the LCFF model because they're seeing the same um, the same uh, pressure on their expenditures with their pension increases and health insurance increases uh, and and some colas because they got big colas uh, four four or five years ago, but their their revenues have not kept pace with you know ours have gone up about five percent. They're looking at a reduction this year down to three. What did you say? Three point four two, I believe. Three point four two, um, which 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 doesn't doesn't take into account the um, the 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 pressure the 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 um, upward pressure from the expenditures and and so that's why you're seeing these massive layoffs at at, at uh, LCFF districts as well as um, you know huge impacts to their curriculum program and, and teaching program. So I think all in all, I know it's painful to, to have reductions in, in staffing, but I, I would say we're, we're on the right path here. Mm-hmm. I think the other, um, the other area that I would add, and we were in a meeting today and we were talking about um, the May revise, and I was with several districts, and it, the, the, the other addition is the uh, special education costs yeah, yeah. that we're not getting um, well, state uh, support nor federal support. A million and five in... in, in more uh, than doubled. Yeah. Yeah. So it's mandated services, but we're not getting the support. Yes. And I think, um, you know, that's something in California they recognize and, they're try- and they, they talk about it, but we still haven't seen the support. Yeah, so if need. you add the special ed yes. uh, encroachment like the, to the, to the uh, uh, pension... And the health insurance, right? It's like a three. It's, it's like a five. Uh, like it's be somewhere between five and five and a half million dollars yeah. in, in, um, essentially uncontrolled cost. I mean, mandated costs that that we have no control over, and but we we're essentially we're obligated to 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 spend the money, but there's really no um, mechanism to reimburse us for a lot of that. Um, so it, it's challenging, but I think, you know, we're fortunate to be um, in, a, in an area where we have a little more control than others, even though it's not all the control that you'd like to see when you're, when you're setting a budget. Thank you to you and Maureen. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that a, you know, I, I, I appreciate I got, Maureen. Well, I think for... Maureen really, you know, she does not get enough credit. I know she gets um, – she gets – criticized un, very unfairly um, by some uh, and and she's um, but she is outstanding and I know I know you know this but but she's Maureen is outstanding 
um, at what she does. And she's, you know, on top of being such a good person, she she really has put these budgets together so that they're they're so easy to follow and 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 the information's all out there. You know, I, I have I have relatives who are teachers up in the Bay Area and they um, Com, you know, I, and I, they ask me about budget issues because they're involved in some negotiations. And I say, just go look at our budget. It's on the website, and they and they're blown away because their schools don't do that, and we do. You know, our our information's out there for everybody and anybody who wants to look at it. And I think that's a, a testament to you and to Maureen. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, we'll move on to. Um, do you, do you have anything, Jamie? I do not. Right. Um, we'll move on to uh, Major U. And um, I-1 is acceptance. We're being asked to accept the completed contract for the purchase of our Gen 7 modular classrooms at the middle school with American Modular Systems. And the completed contract amount is $2,388,707 uh, paid for with Major U. <coughs> Can I get a motion? Move to approve. I one. I second that. All right. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. I two is acceptance of a completed contract uh, for the Gen Seven uh, classrooms at Canalino with the American Modular for one million eight hundred and fifty three thousand seven hundred and sixty four dollars uh, with Major U. Can I get a motion? I move to accept I two acceptance of the completed contract. Or All right. Uh, Second. Great. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, I-3, again, uh, another completed contract, um, this time for the Gen 7s at the high school in the amount of 585140 Oh, sorry, high school computer lab, $585,148, paid for with Major U. I move to accept I-3. Three acceptance of the contract for CHS Computer Lab. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, I four is a completed contract um, with AMS again for the science wing at the high school uh, for two million three hundred eighteen thousand five hundred and fifty eight dollars. Motion to approve. I four. Second that motion. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the I-5 um, is the employment agreement for Major U Facilities Project Coordinator um, uh, for, an, let's see, 960 hours a year at $78 an hour, uh, not to exceed $75,000. Uh, can I get a motion to approve? I move to approve employment agreement for Major U Facilities Project Coordinator. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Nay. Okay. Um, the uh, I-6 is a contract with uh, Nolan Construction Services for project inspection services at various sites. Um, and the hourly rate is $85 for an estimated total of $62,000, $62,560. Paid for with Major U. Can I get a motion to approve? I move to approve I-6, the contract with Nolan Construction Services. I second that. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, uh, I-7 is a contract with uh, Ernest Keys, Kies for professional services uh, for the Division of State Architect, Inspector of Record, and Project Management. Can I get a motion to approve? I move to approve the contract with Ernest Kies. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Nay. All right. Uh, move on to item I-8, uh, acceptance of completed contract, Prop 39 energy efficiency upgrades for um, the high school and the middle school with Scott, um, Scott and Sons Electric for $523,800. Can I get a motion to approve? Move to approve I-8. Second that motion. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. I-9, uh, Major U Summary Expenditure Report uh, 
Do we have a presentation or we just? No, it's, just, the pr it's provided for the board for okay. information. Okay. It's already been prevent, uh, provided to the yep. Bond Oversight Committee. So do we, uh, was this an action item? I didn't, no. it wasn't, okay. So do we want any, any discussion on the major use summary expenditure? Any questions, comments? Okay, we'll move on to uh, J personnel, uh, J1 personnel summary. Can I get a motion to approve? I move to approve the personnel summary. I'm a second. Any discussion there? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, board communications. Rogelio. Uh, yes. Uh, I understand that uh, teachers have to get uh, health benefits, COLA, a raise in salaries. There's also a raise on pensions and, uh, on special aid. Yeah, we all know that. and. Uh, Every year, I've seen that uh, reserves are low. The layoff process uh, is initiated. Reserves go up. Next year, reserves are low again, and so on. And uh, now we have the uh, layoff process, the bumping uh, rights. Uh, Hope that uh, it won't happen. That same thing won't happen as as last year, where mistakes were made, and that's that's something that uh, I cannot go along the way the uh, the process. And to me, uh, if uh, every year. We, the same thing is is going to be happening all over and all over. It's time to uh, uh, that. That's that's why we have professionals everywhere to uh, have a meeting with the minds and come up with this. I mean, what I want is no, it's not to happen again this next year and the next and the next. No, it's I mean uh, at least give me one one good year of not having to go through uh, all of these uh, uh, arguments, all of these discussions. Uh, that's, that's all I hope for. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Jamie. All right, so I should remind everybody, for someone's school, we have our 10th um, spring play coming up on June 6th and 7th. And beyond ha on behalf of someone's school, I'd like to invite all of you to come to the play. I do you have some invitations for all of you that students made at the school that I completely forgot to bring? <laughs> but please let us know. Um, Mr. Laser, who's our director, is his 10th year performing um, for us and doing this for us. It might be his last. We don't know. And so we're hoping everybody will come. It's the Lion King. The kids have been working really hard on it. It's going to be a really cute play. So I hope you guys will come and enjoy it with us. Thank you. Thank you. Sally. Um, I just wanted to uh, once again congratulate all the dedicated uh, staff who was who are retiring this year. There's a lot of service between all those people dedicated to this district. Um, I was able to attend the Beauty and the Beast production, and I agree with you, Diana. It was very fun, um, amazing, great production by Elise Unruh and the students. So I congratulate them all. And I also attended the. Um, elementary school band performance the other night at the middle school and I must say that the I didn't see the third and fourth grade but the fifth grade students did an, a stellar performance of musical uh, treats for all of us so congratulations to Mr. Pavia and those students thank you um, so yeah we we had a hundred and seventy four years of service retiring oh, wow. tonight so that was it's a lot it was it was uh um but yeah i i would like to also just thank the dedicated professionals we have working in our district. Um, from the elementary all the way to the high school the, the coaches and the and the um uh 
extracurricular uh, instructors, FFAs, having their, their uh, barbecue tonight. Uh, and and we've got two top-notch teachers there, so it's, uh, it's really good to see all the, hap the uh, exciting things going on in our district. Um, and we're looking forward to graduations coming up and promotion ceremonies. It's always the, I, that's always my favorite time of the year. So, okay, with that, I think uh, we don't have anything um, for the calendar, do we? Yes, we do. Oh, we do. Okay. Yes, we do. We just want to remind you that next week we have the board visits, mm -hmm. the spring board tours. We're starting on Monday, June third, at nine o'clock at CMS. Okay. And then on Tuesday, June 4th at 9 o'clock at Canalino. We'll, we'll send out a reminder with the itineraries. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Okay. With that, I think we're adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.